Good morning, everyone. Welcome here. I didn't know Randy Tarchuk was coming this morning, or he would be standing here, but everyone else was away, couldn't help, so I will be doing what I tell other people to do, and I don't know how to do it. Um, let's start with the exciting stuff. Yesterday, Shayla and I spent a few hours half installing our new sound system, so it is exciting. It sounds, I, I know you probably can't, oh, I don't have my phone on me. I was going to play through the microphone. Uh, it was kind of, if you have Facebook or Instagram and you follow Banff Park Church, just go listen to it there. The difference was just absolutely shocking. It sounded like the old stuff, we were kind of underwater and drowning, and the new stuff just all of a sudden was just bright and clear, and so we're really excited for that, as well as there's a lot more work that Shayla and I have to do and fiddle. Uh, if you're watching online, you will see there's a new camera. Well, you won't see, but you will be seeing through the new camera. Uh, we have to do a little bit of fiddling and tweaking as well with that, and um, we're going to mount it a little bit differently, but it should be so much better of a viewing experience for people at home, or if you miss a Sunday and need to catch up, uh, it'll be wonderful. So special thank you to our anonymous generous donor who decided that that should be done. So thank you to them, and thank you to Shayla for helping me with all stuff. We, we learned a lot of stuff yesterday. Uh, also, there is a directory at the back by Ryan. If you have had any kind of change, if you're you have a new email address or you got a new phone number or something like that and you need to update it, please do so just so we can make sure to give you the regular uh, up email updates or, or a phone call or something so that we don't call some random person who doesn't know who we are. Uh, please do watch the countdown video, um, perhaps on your own even, if you're like, oh, I wonder what events were happening or when Bible studies are. All those are on there, and you can just jump online and watch that at any point. Uh, if you do have any questions about those, you can contact either the church office or directly to whoever the leader of that various ministry is. We have men's groups and women's groups and two different young adult groups. There's lots of ways to get involved. As well, I'm just going to give you uh, no information because I don't have it, but our missions committee is working on some new exciting stuff that they're going to want to pass on. Our goal as a church is to re, re understand what we think of when we think of that word missions. Missions is not meant to be the mission, well, not only meant to be the missionary who's overseas serving the Lord, but also how can we serve one another? How can we serve our community? How can we be actively engaged with people who live in the Bow Valley? And so that's what our missions committee is, is doing and getting ready to give some information. And so there's going to be, a, a, I say, a challenge, is that fair to say, uh, of, of here's how we can get involved to be more missional as a church. So they'll explain that in the coming weeks. We're excited uh, for that. I do believe there is Sunday school today. Yes, there is Sunday school today, so kids take note of that when I forget to dismiss you. Uh, that is all I have this morning. Anything else we should be made aware of? All right, then Jordan and Shay and Sid, you can come up, and while you're coming up, let's just bow in prayer. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you that we get to worship you. You are truly an awesome God. We are so excited to sing praise to you, to open scripture, to let it transform our hearts and our minds. God, we want to honor you with how we live. Would you meet us in a very powerful way this morning that we might know, not just intellectually, but in our hearts, that you love us, that you care for us, and that you want to be in relationship with us. Be with us over these next moments. Amen. Morning. You guys know the drill. You got to stand up. Not just me, right? <laughs> nice to see you all this morning. Um, we're going to sing some songs. I don't have anything deep and meaningful to say. <laughs> uh, I, I think they're really good songs for because we're learning about the fiery furnace today, and we are not doing Rack Shack and Benny for Sunday school. <laughs> I think we already had a discussion about that one. <laughs>
get that funny feeling that nobody can see the words. That's what I thought. It's a good thing this is like a super repetitive song. Okay, so um, you guys kind of figured out the, uh, the way this goes. I just repeat the same thing and you repeat the same thing as well. Shall, shall I keep going? Let's just finish this one. Is that cool? Okay. Righteousness, righteousness is what I long for. Righteousness is what I need. Righteousness, righteousness is what you want from me. about to go and now we're going to do a kid song that has no words okay <laughs> are, are we good okay. we'll be tested by the fire persecuted and reviled maybe either way there will be trials we will hold on We'll be tested by the blessing With all the comforts of the world surrounding We will not forget the Savior We will hold on We will hold on to your love We will hold on to your love When the world is silent to praise on some We will hold on perfect song for talking about the fiery furnace. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh. 
The door, that includes you, Smanga. There you go. Well, good morning again. If you want to just open up to uh, the book of Daniel, we're going to continue our journey through. Now, if it was a secret, Jordan let it slip. We're dealing with the fiery furnace today. And that's probably a, a very familiar text uh, for some of you, uh, especially if you grew up in Sunday school or watched VeggieTales. Um, and so this just uh, may be a recap for you, but I hope that kind of the main things really stand out to you and really challenge you this morning. But before we actually get there, I just want to read something from Jeremiah 29, and it'll be on the screen. But I referenced this just in passing uh, a couple of times over the weeks, and I realized that I should probably read this and explain just briefly what's going on. Jeremiah 29, 4-7. This is just before the people are going to be going into exile. Jeremiah um, prophesies from God. Here's what God says. Here's what's going to happen. He says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem, Jerusalem to Babylon. Excuse me. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will find your wealth. 
And so when you start to think about all the things that Daniel does and how he talks, uh, or, or I guess how we read the things that he does, as simple as when Nebuchadnezzar is going to kill all the wise men because none of them can tell the dream and interpret it. When Daniel does, he very easily, and we talked about this, he very easily could have been like, yeah, you should get rid of everybody else. They're incapable. But he doesn't. He pleads for their lives as well. And it's because he knew this prophecy. He understood that God is in control and even going into exile, he says, pray for the city. Pray for them. Now, the reality here is that God loves the Babylonians just as much as he loves the Jewish people. God wants to be in relationship with them. He wants them to repent and turn towards him. And ideally, that is what we are called to do as Christians, is not to just go, well, those people are really bad and evil. I'm not going to talk about Jesus with them. When the truth of the matter is they desperately need to hear of Jesus. And so that's the mindset that Daniel and and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, that's their mindset as they walk through this book, as we read through these things, is that they aren't there just in the sense of like, well, God didn't know what he was doing. He let us get into exile. No, they trust him completely, and they understand that he has purpose and meaning in this. And part of that is for that entire nation to be blessed. Again, when you think of patterns, when you think of what does the Bible say as a whole, this goes all the way back to Abraham. What did God promise Abraham? I will bless those who bless you. You will become a blessing to all nations, and through you, they will see who I am. That's what God says. And so even in exile, even as the Jewish people are taken away from, and again, because of their wickedness, their refusal to obey God and their refusal to do what is right, is there's consequences for that. But even in that, God still wants to use them as a blessing to the other nations that they might see him. All right, let's, let's begin here this morning into chapter 3 of Daniel. I just wanted to clarify that just because uh, I, I just referenced it, but I didn't get into it. Now, in chapter 3 here, we have a shift from the the Hebrew names of these three friends of Daniel into the Babylonian names, and and that's how I'm going to refer to them, simply because that's how they're referred to in this part of the Bible. And so, we're not trying to also get rid of their Jewish identity, we're just trying to be consistent with what Scripture says, and so there's no confusion if I say different names than you read, and you go, wait a minute, what's going on? So that's what will happen here. So let's read. Uh, It's a big section again, but I just don't know how to break it up. 1 to 30, so the whole of chapter 3, it says this. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, whose height was 60 cubits and its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the province to come to the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. They stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, uh, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the people heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree. Every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. 
They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image, the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated, and he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, but I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. And the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had Sorry, the fire had not had any power over the bodies of these men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has set his angels and delivered his servants who trusted in him, and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree, any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins, for there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So now we shift, right, from Daniel to his three friends, but the same essential story happens. The same pattern repeats and this is Daniel's way of highlighting various things throughout these years, showing that God is sovereign, that God is in control, and that God is doing great things, despite the fact that they're in exile, despite the fact that they don't feel that they're a unified people any longer and, and probably are quite upset about that, at least many of them. So if you remember last week, what was the dream that Daniel interpreted? Anybody? Anybody? Nobody. Come on now. All right, I'll give you the answer. It's a giant statue of the varying things, but what, what was the top part? Thank you, Ryan. A big gold head of Nebuchadnezzar, right? But then what was the point of the dream? God saying, I'm going to come, or, or essentially the Messiah is going to come, and he's going to destroy all the power that the, these kingdoms have, and they'll be turned to dust and blow away, and they will be no more. Right, that's the point of it. And so what does King Nebuchadnezzar do right away? You know what would be a really good idea? I'm going to make an image of gold of myself, or maybe of one of the gods. That part's not clear. 
But I'm going to make this image of gold that's just like this dream that Daniel had because that seemed like a really good idea and then everyone's going to worship it. Does this make any sense? Like he had just heard what happened and then fell prostrate before Daniel and went, your God is the God of gods. He's the most powerful. No other God could do this. He's amazing. Uh, but in my own arrogance, I'm going to do it anyway. It just seems so strange. So we don't know, like I said, whether this was actually himself that he uh, made or one of the Babylonian gods. But the point is the same, is that he is still trying, no matter who it is, whether it's the Babylonians, the Jewish people, or anyone else that he's brought into exile. And we see that when he says all peoples, nations, languages, everyone who's there. He's still trying to strip them of their identity and make them assimilate under his leadership. He's trying to say, I own you. You do what I say. You worship who I worship. You're not free to have any kind of identity of any kind. That's the goal. In fact, even some uh, commentators suggest that the reason that he made this statue is because a little bit of time has gone between chapter 2 and 3, and in that time his own heart gets hardened and his arrogance increases, and he goes, I'm going to make a statue that's so big, that's so mighty, that no one can destroy it. And because I'm going to make it just of me and just of gold, that the other kingdoms aren't even going to come, but this will seal that Babylon is the greatest ever. Now, whether that's true or not, it's hard to know, but what we see throughout the first couple of chapters, and especially as we move on, is that Nebuchadnezzar gets more and more and more consumed with his own self, with power, with control, thinking that he is the greatest of all kings. He is the greatest of all leaders on the whole world. And so his own arrogance is is ultimately going to become his downfall. We talked about that lots last week, so we won't dwell there. So he builds this image, and then he calls everyone together, and he says, whenever you hear the music, any kind of music, you're going to fall down, you're going to worship this statue. Now, if you remember back to last week, we understood, or we talked about this idea that Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians live in this polytheistic nation, which means they serve multiple gods. And they pray to all kinds of gods, and they worship all kinds of gods. And so even though he was willing to say to Daniel, your God is more powerful than all those other gods, he's missing the point because Exodus 20, we looked at, says the first commandment is what? You shall have no other God before me. Quick test, what's the second one? No idols. So, one was broken last week, now two is broken here. Not only am I going to make an idol, I'm going to make everybody worship it and bow down. Well, it comes with a threat. If you don't, you're going to be thrown into a fiery furnace. Your, your life is in your own hands here. If you do not do what I say, you are going to die. And this isn't some kind of like passive attempt of the king to try to like gain allegiance from everyone. Because remember, just a short while ago is when nobody could interpret or nobody could tell him his dream. He was ready to have every single wise man killed. It was in the process of happening when Daniel stepped up. So this is not some kind of idle threat here. This is very real. But because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego grew up with the Hebrew Scriptures and understood there is no God before me and we will not make an idol, we will not bow down to an idol. They're holding on to that truth, to what God has told them. They will not do that because it is a violation of the one true God that they serve. Before we get to their specific details, we see in verse 6 that the Chaldeans come forward and they maliciously accuse the Jews. Notice the wording there. Remember we talked about how jealousy starts to creep in because you have Daniel and his friends who are ten times wiser than everyone who's ever been serving the king. They're very upset about that and they think, well, we should have all this authority, but you, king, you've given it to the Jews. Well, you see that here too. You, O king, verse 10, have made a decree that everyone should do this, but, this is 12 now, there are certain Jews whom what? 
you have appointed that don't follow after you. So there's, there's jealousy. They're trying to maliciously accuse. They're trying to have them killed, right? This is not like a gentle little tattletale going, those guys, they're not doing what they're supposed to. Would you get them in line? They're like, this is our chance to get rid of them and have them killed. And then they actually blame the king for it too. You see that little passive-aggressive attempt there? It's kind of like when your child at home does something wrong, but, but you don't want to take any ownership, and you look at your spouse and you say, your son, right? They did, right, somehow trying to distance ourselves from that. It wasn't my fault. But if you didn't have that bad habit, then they wouldn't. Just for a record, that is not good marital advice, just in case that isn't stated right up front. Same thing here is real passive aggressive, trying to blame the king. Look what you have done. You brought these Jews in, and we knew they weren't going to submit to our gods, but you let them in anyway. You exalted them. You put them into high places of leadership, and now they are defying your very orders, which is only going to lead to further defiance among everybody. You have to kill them. They're kind of putting them in a corner here. And let's not forget, king, you said you would kill them. So, How does King Nebuchadnezzar respond to this? Pretty much exactly like King Nebuchadnezzar responds to everything. He is not the most even-tempered king. Right? He just freaks out. Says he's in furious rage that they would do that. So they bring him before and they go, okay, is this true that you will not bow down? But then notice what he says, and this is seemingly out of character. What does he say? You have one more chance. If you will do this, fine, well and good. But if you don't, you're going to die. I think, as you kind of read the text and kind of see the inferences there, I think what he's doing is it's, a, it's an attempt to undo what his Chaldean people have just said. He's trying to go, don't really want to kill them because I'm the one who put them in that place. I want them to submit to me. So I'm going to show you that I can make them. It's like this last-ditch effort or this last-ditch attempt at that. If you do this, then well and good. But if you don't, you're going to be cast into the fire furnace. Now, here's the key verses of the text. Who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? What did he just learn last chapter? That there is one God who is more powerful than every God of the Babylonians. He confessed it. In fact, he basically groveled at Daniel's feet going, we don't have any God like this. So what is he doing now? Yeah, he's powerful, but I'm more powerful. There's no way he'll save you from me. What God is there who's going to save you? And I love Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's response. They say simply this, we have no need to answer you in this. I don't need to defend myself. Because it's not to you that I'm accountable, it's to God and to God alone. And so I don't need to make an excuse. You know full well that we are committed to worshiping the one true God. And they actually answer already, if you're going to do this, our God who we serve, he's actually able to save us. You say he's not able, you say no God is able to save from your hand, our God is able to save us. He is capable. Now, again, This is huge for us to understand the implications because this isn't some just like hypothetical situation of like whose dad is stronger than the next dad, right? Like this is, they're standing there and the king is furious and raging and going, if you do not bow down, you're dead. They go, our God will save us. He is able. And then verse 18, and I've referenced this a few times over the years. This is one of my favorite verses in the Old Testament. But if not, some translations say, but even if he doesn't. It's not hypothetical. We know what's at stake here, and we know that he is able and he is capable, but we don't know that he will. And we're okay with that. We're going to submit ourselves under that. This is the great... Out of this text, and and perhaps out of the Bible, this is one of the greatest things that we can learn, is that our trust in God is not dependent on our circumstances. Our trust in God is saying, I believe that you are just and you will do what is right, no matter what I think is right. 
Whether you miraculously save me because I know you're capable, we've seen it, we've witnessed it, we've read about it. When you read through the Old Testament, you see all kinds of miracles. You turn to the New Testament, you see all kinds of miracles. But miracles don't always happen. They're in God's providence and they're in His timing. And what they're saying, our God is able. They fully submit to the sovereignty of God. Stephen Miller wrote it this way. He says, Although no doubt existed in the minds of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego about the ability of God to deliver them, they humbly accept the fact that God does not always choose to intervene miraculously in human circumstances, even on behalf of his servants. That's huge for us to understand. We live in a culture where we want to worship God if he does certain things that we think benefit our lives, that make them better. And we've determined in, that, in our culture that that means easier. And that's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible says, will you trust me even when I don't do what you think I should do? See, because if we don't, if we say, God, I'll trust you up to a certain point, but if you do something crazy, then I know that I'm actually smarter than you and I should be the one that's in charge. That's no different than idolatry. We're worshiping ourselves, we're serving ourselves, and not God. We don't know all things. We have no idea what God is fully capable of, just like the king doesn't hear and declares, no, God is going to save you. I am way too powerful. Back in 400 AD, there was a a great theologian who, who did, he had many great contributions to understanding the Bible. His name was Jerome, and he said it very plainly. Thereby, they indicated that it will not be a matter of God's inability, but rather of his sovereignness. Or sorry, of a sovereign will if they do perish. Think of it. They're literally saying, if we die, that's not because you're powerful. That's because that's what God's done in his sovereign will. Even if you kill us, you don't get the credit. How do you like deal with someone like that? They look at this and they go, no matter what the outcome of this situation is, God is in it and will use it for good, Romans 8. Do we believe that? Or when we go through hard times, do we immediately cry foul and say, God, what are you doing? I'll confess I do that part way too too much. We need to look at the danger that stands in front of us, the uncertainty, the sickness, the disease, the loss, whatever it might be in front of us, and we need to say, God, this hurts, it's painful, I don't know how to process it just yet, but help me trust you in the midst of this. That you know what you're doing. That you have good in store for it, and while it might not be the good that I expect, it will be what you want it to be. Now, don't hear me saying that that means that there's this confusion with God's sovereignty where you go, well, it was God's will that I sinned and did that. It's not what we're saying. It's not as though we're all robots and God's made this. This is what happens and this is what happens and you don't have any choices. He's fully sovereign and yet he's given us free will. And I don't know how to make those two things jive in my mind perfectly. But I think that makes sense because if God is all powerful and he's way more than I could ever imagine and understand, then it should make sense that I can't fully understand some of those concepts. God is fully in control. We need to view it the way that Job viewed it in Job 13, verse 15. He says this, Though he slay me, I will hope in him. Right? The whole book of Job is, and we've talked about this over the summer, it's to have a theology of suffering, to understand that God is at work in the midst no matter when we think we can feel it or see it. We have no need to answer you. Our God is able to save us, but even if he doesn't. So what does Nebuchadnezzar do? Well, he's filled with fury again. (laughs) At least he's consistent, right? 
I wrote in my sermon, and I had to delete it because it's just, it's just awful, but I said, actually, and I didn't mean this, but I said, he is very fiery character. Then I realized that's, uh, I don't know why I said it now, I just think it's funny. He's as angry as could be, and, and you see that, and then it says, he ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. Now, don't get hung up on that. It's, it's an expression, right? As hot as possible. Like, you think it was hot before, we're going to make this thing as hot as possible. And actually, this might be a good project for you, is if you go back and look at Babylonian furnaces to how they built things, um, you'll kind of get a better visual of how you had to walk up around that something that was kind of built into the ground with an opening. And so you opened it, and you filled everything in it, and then you closed it, and then it started on fire, and then you would throw things from the top into it, and it would heat and heat and heat and get hotter. And so that's the image that we have here. And so he orders, he's like, okay, we're going to get some mighty men of the army. Why do you think he's getting mighty men of the army all of a sudden? I think he's getting the mighty men because he's actually a little bit afraid now. You have that much faith, that much trust, that I control your life? And they go, no, 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 you don't. You just think you do. God does. So he gets some of his mighty men to take them up and they go to throw them in the fire and as they throw them in the fire, the mighty men die and they don't. Ian Dugoy points out the irony here. He says, God is able to save his people even though they were the ones facing the death sentence while the king is unable to save his own guards though they were the ones that were to carry out that death sentence. So king, who's in control? Who has power? You can't even save your people. I can save, speaking on God's behalf here, I can save everybody. Now, I don't know if if this is the verse that was on their minds, but clearly they understand the Hebrew Bible to this point. And in Isaiah 43, 2, we read this. And Isaiah is writing this to the future exiles. And I, I would just have this belief that If you went into exile, you would all of a sudden recall a lot of stuff that was prophesied about your exile. But it says this, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. Isaiah was saying God was faithful back then. God will be faithful in this generation. He'll be faithful in the next generation. Again, we can't read that to mean we can all just go jump in a fire and we'll all be fine and not get burned. That's not the point. The point is to these exiles that you go is that God is in control and he will save. Because God is in the business of saving. So they're thrown into the furnace and they land and they're, they're fine. Walking around, totally normal, and then a fourth person is suddenly among them And the king is actually the first to point this out, which I think is interesting, right? Didn't we just throw three people? Why do I see four? And one of them is the appearance of like a son of the gods. Now, if you know this text and you were hopeful to hear who that person is, I can't tell you. So sorry. There's a great debate amongst commentators about is this simply an angel um, and there's a lot of belief that it is uh, one of the archangels, but is it also could be the way that it's worded, a pre-incarnate Jesus, before he's even come to the earth to be with them, to save them. Now again, if we get hung up on that, we're missing the point of the text. The point of the text is that God saves. And yes, that points us back to the cross, to Jesus, to understand that he is the reason that we have any kind of atonement. He's the reason that we have salvation. And so could it have been a pre-incarnate Jesus? Sure, it could have been. Was it? I don't know. I'm not smart enough to answer that for you. Nebuchadnezzar realizes this. Obviously is in shock and awe and can't believe what he's seeing of, of miracles happening before him. But I think what's crazier yet is the miracle that's happening before him was just told by the three guys that are in the fire right now. This God is capable. He can save us. This isn't some hypothetical 20, 30, 40 years later and he's lost. This is in the moment. They're walking around. So he calls them, come out. 
Interestingly enough, the fourth figure is gone. But the three of them come out and all gather around him and they go, this is a miracle. What, what your God has done is beyond powerful. Now, now again, just like earlier in chapter 2, when all the wise men say, there is no, there's no one on earth who can do what you're asking of us because gods don't do what you're asking. And then the one true God does come and do that. In the same way here, when King says, who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? They say, well, it's going to be the one true God, and then he delivers in that way. And so again, King Nebuchadnezzar is forced to, into the situation to see again the power and the might of the one true God of Israel. Does this not seem like all kinds of grace and mercy extended to Nebuchadnezzar? I'm going to show you how powerful I am. Not just once. I'm going to continually show you my power and my might. If he has this kind of power and might, he could very easily just wipe Babylon off the map, put the Jews back, start over. But he has a different plan and he has a different purpose. And that plan and that purpose includes a great deal of mercy to those nations because he wants to be in relationship with them. So again, the king cries out, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Sounds very similar to last week. He sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own. Unfortunately, what you'll see as we read through is it doesn't take long for Nebuchadnezzar to forget that, oh wait, God is more powerful than me. He's just filled with his own arrogance and pride. He continually goes back to his control, to his power, rather than serve the one true God. And I want to make the argument that it's simply because in a polytheistic nation, there's just so many gods that if a newer, more powerful one comes, even if he's more powerful than you imagined, even then if he proves that he's more powerful over and over, he's still just one of the gods. I think this is why the Ten Commandments start with, you shall have no other gods before me. Because worship of the one true God is what he longs for. Not because he's some egocentral maniac, but because he understands that nothing else can satisfy. Nothing else is worthy. And when you worship something that's inferior, you're missing out on who God truly is. Again, it sounds like he's making some kind of concession, but... He hasn't yet, but he does at least make this decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. In exile, having your identity stripped away, being told you cannot worship your God, and through their faithfulness, the king not only goes back on his decree, but now says nobody can say anything negative about the one true God. Who's in control? Who has all the power and all the might and is sovereign? The one true king. And so this is where we end today, and this is the challenge that then comes to us. Will we choose to trust and put our faith in a God when nothing seems to make sense that's in front of us? When we don't understand the whys, when we don't understand the hows, when we're in pain, when we're hurt, when we're grieving, when we're whatever it is, are we willing to say, God, you see a picture that I don't, and I will trust you, no matter what, no matter the cost. The truth of the matter, and I always mention this with Paul, is he simply says this is to live as Christ and to die is what? If you want to kill me, that's okay because I don't belong here anyway. I belong in eternity with Christ. If we have that perspective, if we're so devoted to Christ 
That doesn't mean we're not going to have pain. That doesn't mean we're not going to hurt. That doesn't mean we're not going to have confusion. But it means that despite all those things, we will go, I will choose to trust you no matter what. And if it costs me my life, I get to go be with you. And that is greater than anything I could ever ask for. The next time you go through hardship, the next time you go through pain and hurt and struggle, remind yourself of this story. Remind yourself that God is able to save and he can do miracles. And then on the flip side, remind, but even if he doesn't, still worship him. What we're going to do is we're going to pray and we're going to close uh, for those of you who are watching online. But for those of you who are here at the conclusion of that prayer, we're going to put a song up on the screen and over the speakers for you. Sometimes it's good to see and to experience what we've just talked about in a slightly different way. And so I want to play that song for you. Uh, Those of you online, we don't have the copyright uh, abilities to show this, but if you just want to jump on YouTube or, or Spotify or whatever it is and look up the song Burn Us Up by Shane and Shane, you'll experience the same thing that we are here. And I hope that that really, really will encourage you to remember that even if he doesn't intervene in the way that we expect, that he is still God and he can still be trusted. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for this very uh, familiar story to many of us, and yet sometimes we, we just get caught up in a miracle and, and we forget that really all this story is is about a trust and a faithfulness that we will worship you and you alone, no matter the cost. And so God, give us the belief and understanding, give us the faith and the trust to know that despite the circumstances that we find ourselves in today, that you are still trustworthy. That we can walk with you no matter what's happening. And even if it costs us our life, as Paul says, to die is gain. May we view our lives with that sentiment that we will get to be with you in eternity. And there's nothing that this earth has that can compare with that. God, we love you. Help us to focus on you this week. Help us to go back to these verses. Our God is able to save, but even if he doesn't, we will still be faithful. Amen.